नमस्कार वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन परस्पेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज आर एस रघु एंड विद मी इज रेणुका आर एस ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर द हेडलाइंस External Affairs Minister of India Dr Jay Shankar says world must never compromise with the evil of terrorism in any form at the UN Security Council UNESCO calls for the protection of Afghanistan's cultural heritage and the safety of its artists Foreign nations join in rescue and relief operations in Haiti as death tolls from earthquake soared to over 2000 India administers over 57 crore vaccine doses under nationwide covid vaccination program and WHO urges nations to hold back booster doses amidst slow rate of covid-19 vaccination globally As the nationwide free covid-19 vaccination campaign at government facilities for those above 18 years is underway we advise our young listeners to get vaccinated and help others to get vaccinated We also advise our listeners not to lower their guard as COVID-19 remains a threat to our health. Please stay at home unless it is essential to go out and continue to follow these three simple steps. Wear a face mask, maintain 2 gaz ki doori for social distancing, focus on hand and face hygiene. For any COVID related information and guidance contact national helpline numbers 0112397 and 1075. And now the news in detail. External Affairs Minister of India Dr S Jay Shankar on Thursday said the world must never compromise with the evil of terrorism and terrorism in all its forms and manifestations must be condemned chairing the UN Security Council briefing on threats to international peace and security caused by terrorist act this evening in New York he said there cannot be any exception or any justification for any act of terrorism regardless of motivations behind such acts the minister stressed that the menace of terrorism cannot and should not be associated with any religion nationality civilization or any ethnic group in spite of the progress we have made to tighten the legal security financing and other frameworks to combat terrorism terrorists are constantly finding newer ways of motivating resourcing and executing acts of terror unfortunately there are also some countries who seek to undermine or subvert our collective resolve to fight terrorism that cannot be allowed to pass expressing concerns over the developments in afghanistan dr jashankar drew attention to the link between haqqani network and the growing terrorism in the region Events unfolding in Afghanistan have naturally enhanced global concerns about their implications for both regional and international security. The heightened activities of the prescribed Haqqani network justifies this growing anxiety. Whether it is in Afghanistan or against India, groups like Lashkar-e-Toiba and Jaish-e-Mohammed continue to operate with both impunity and encouragement. It is therefore vital this council does not take a selective, tactical or even a complacent view of the problems we face. Dr. Jashankar said unfortunately there are also some countries who seek to undermine or subvert collective resolve by terrorism and this cannot be allowed to pass. He added that ISIL continues to pose a critical threat to international peace and security. ISIL remains active in Syria and Iraq and its affiliates are growing in strength. The minister said the radicalization of vulnerable youth remains a serious concern. External Affairs Ministry has added additional numbers to its 24/7 special Afghanistan cell. Ministry has set up a special Afghanistan cell to coordinate repatriation and other requests from Afghanistan. The contact numbers of the special cell are 9714705379011490167830114901678 and 0114901678. The emails are mea helpdesk india at gmail.com and situation room at mea.gov.in the whatsapp numbers are 8010611290 9599321199 and 704204994 
U S President Joe Biden said its troops would remain in Afghanistan until all Americans are evacuated. In an interview, President Biden said that the turmoil in Kabul was unavoidable. Mr. Biden said the U S would stay to get all Americans out of Afghanistan, even if it meant remaining beyond the 31st of August deadline for a complete withdrawal. Biden reiterated his pledge to help evacuate those Afghans and their families who had helped the U.S. Army during their 20-year stay in the country. He said between 10,000 and 15,000 Americans needed to be evacuated, along with 50,000 to 65,000 Afghans, such as former translators for the American military. About 4,500 U.S. troops are in temporary control of Karzai International Airport in the capital, Kabul. The United Nations Cultural Agency, UNESCO, has called for the protection of Afghanistan's cultural heritage and to ensure a safe environment for artists. Afghanistan is home to two UNESCO World Heritage Sites, including the Bamiyan Valley. The Taliban infamously blew up two giant Buddha statues in the Bamiyan Valley before the U.S. war on terror in Afghanistan was launched. Amid the rapidly unfolding events and 20 years after the deliberate destruction of the Bamiyan Buddhas, a World Heritage Site, UNESCO Director General Audrey Azule in a statement on Thursday called for the preservation of Afghanistan's cultural heritage. The UNESCO said Afghanistan's diverse heritage and cultural sites were an integral part of the Afghan history and identity and of importance for humanity as a whole. The UNESCO added that it is crucial for the future of Afghanistan to safeguard and preserve these landmarks. A joint statement by countries including Argentina, Australia, Brazil, the European Union, New Zealand, the United Kingdom and the United States of America, among others expressed deep concern over Afghan women and girls, their right to education, work and freedom of movement. The statement called on those in positions of power and authority across Afghanistan to guarantee their protection. The statement added that Afghan women and girls, as all Afghan people, deserve to live in safety, security and dignity. Any form of discrimination and abuse should be prevented. Meanwhile, China continues to calibrate its policy to recognize the legitimacy of the Taliban militants in the aftermath of the fall of the government of former President Ashraf Ghani. China said on Thursday that the Afghanistan Taliban had become more rational than it was two decades ago and called on other nations to be more objective in judging the situation facing Afghanistan. Prasar Bharati, special correspondent in Beijing, reports that experts say that China's approach towards Afghanistan has been equally guided by its economic interest in the country besides security concerns. As per Western media reports this week, China appears to be eyeing to clinch lucrative projects to exploit mineral-rich Afghanistan, especially the trillions of dollars worth of rare earth metals which Chinese official media reacted to sharply. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokeswoman Hua Shunying said on Thursday that China was aware of the suspicions towards the Taliban. On Wednesday, China said it will decide on extending diplomatic recognition to the Taliban in Afghanistan after the formation of the government in the country, which it hoped would be open, inclusive and broadly representative. It has also called on Taliban to shun its support to terror groups in the region. Rare earth metals in Afghanistan were estimated to be worth anywhere between 1 trillion to 3 trillion trillion US dollars in 2020. Rare earth metals are a key component for a host of advanced technologies like high-tech electronic equipment, phones and high-tech missile guidance systems among others. The death toll from the devastating earthquake that struck Haiti has risen to 2,189. The Civil Protection Agency tweeted that 2,189 people were killed and more than 12,260 people injured in the quake. An earthquake hit the southern, southwestern part of the country last Saturday, about 160 kilometers to the west of the capital, Port Au Prince. The agency said that 332 people reported missing and rescue operations were going on. Tens of thousands of buildings were also destroyed and damaged in the quake. Shortly after the earthquake, a tropical storm brought ter torrential downpours on survivors already coping with the catastrophe. Meanwhile, the UK government has announced a package of up to £1 million of initial support to Haiti as the country recovers from the recent devastating earthquake. In a statement, the UK government said that the Royal Navy ship 
آر ایس اے ویو نائٹ ول آلسو سپورٹ دی یو ایس کانٹریبیوشن ٹو دی انٹرنیشنل ہیومینٹیرین ریسپانس اے ٹیم آف فور میڈیکل ایکسپرٹس فرام دی یو کے اٹلی اینڈ فرانس اسپیشلائز ان ایمرجنسی میڈیسن ری ہیپلیٹیشن اینڈ لوجسٹکس ایز ویل ایز ہیومینٹیرین ہیلتھ کیئر دا اسٹیٹمنٹ سیڈ دیٹ دے آر ایکسپیکٹڈ ٹو ڈیپلائی فار اپ ٹو ٹو ویکس دس از آل انڈیا ریڈیو گیونگ یو دی نیوز فار کوئک نیوز اپ ڈیٹ فرام دا کلاک فالوز آن ٹویٹر ایٹ اے آئی آر نیوز الرٹس Welcome back to the World News. The cumulative number of doses in India's COVID vaccination drive has crossed the 57 crore mark on Thursday. India's Health Ministry has termed it as yet another achievement in its fight against COVID-19. The recovery rate currently stands at 97.53%, which is the highest since March 2020. Daily positivity rate is at 1.94% which is less than 3% for the last 24 hours. Now the coronavirus updates from around the world. The World Health Organization WHO on Wednesday condemned the rush by wealthy countries to provide COVID vaccine booster shots while millions around the world have yet to receive a single dose. The rebuke came ahead of the US announcing that all vaccinated Americans would soon be eligible to receive additional doses. WHO experts insisted that there was not enough scientific evidence that boosters were needed. They added that providing them while so many were still waiting to be immunized was immoral. Earlier this month, the WHO called for a moratorium on COVID vaccine booster shots to help ease the drastic inequity in dose distribution between rich and poor nations. In Bangladesh, amid the continuing COVID pandemic, the daily death toll has dropped to the lowest in more than the last six weeks. According to the latest data released by the Directorate General of Health Services on Thursday, 159 people died and 6,566 new corona positive cases were reported in the country. Other indicators have also shown improvement with sample positivity rate coming down to 17.64% on Thursday from a high of 32.55% on 24th of July. The recovery rate has also gone up to 92.4% from approximately 84% a month earlier on July the 18th. The active cases have come down to 85,157 from over 1.5 lakh at the beginning of this month. Prasar Bharati, special correspondent in Dhaka, reports that Bangladesh has opened tourist places after a gap of nearly five months. The opening follows the relaxations in the COVID-19 restrictions announced earlier this month. However, health safety measures like wearing of masks will need to be followed at the tourist spots and hotels. Furthermore, the community centers and recreation venues have also become functional from Thursday at half of their capacity. The U.S. has announced a plan to ensure the safe return to in-person school. In a statement, the White House said that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has made clear that the Delta variant is driving an increase in COVID-19 cases nationally. It added that it is critical for schools to protect students against exposure. U.S. President Joe Biden has also announced that all staff at nursing homes will need to get vaccinated in order for the facility to continue receiving federal Medicare and Medicaid funding. Meanwhile, Australia's two most popular states registered a record number of new infections on Thursday as the country struggles to control the spread of the coronavirus, in part due to the surge in highly infectious Delta variant. At the UN Security Council briefing on threats to international peace and security, the USA emphasized that nations must work together to prevent Afghanistan from becoming a terrorist base. Today I'd like to discuss the current state of the threat posed by ISIS and everything we can do to counter that threat, especially by undercutting its finances. To start, we are deeply worried by the Secretary General's assessment that ISIS continues to expand throughout Africa especially in various parts of West Africa and the Sahel, in addition to Central and East Africa. To neutralize that expansion, the United States is providing critical counterterrorism assistance to disrupt, degrade, and respond to terrorist activity perpetrated by ISIS. Our tactical training, mentorship, and equipment strengthens the capacity of the law enforcement, judicial sector, and communities in our partner nations to respond to this growing threat. In June, ISIS Khorasan attacked a Halo Trust camp in northern Afghanistan, killing 10 
and injuring 16. This attack on a humanitarian group working to rid the country of landmines show, shows the barbarity of ISIS Khorasan and its efforts to undermine the Afghan people's security. Given the the representative of the United States at the Council also underlined the role of modern technologies such as cryptocurrency in terror financing. The USA also emphasized on the need to protect the human rights of women and children. Meanwhile, the representative of the UK at the UN expressed deep concern over the developments in Afghanistan and termed it a tragedy. What is happening now in Afghanistan is a tragedy. We will remain vigilant to the return of the terrorist threat. We all share an interest in making sure Afghanistan does not again become a safe haven for terrorists. The threat continues to grow in sub-Saharan Africa. We are providing security, stabilization and humanitarian assistance in many countries to help them tackle the threat, build stability and support affected communities. Meanwhile, Daesh continues its attempts to incite and recruit supporters around the world, particularly using social media and encrypted online platforms. Terrorism is global and it requires a global response. Multilateral co cooperation lies at the heart of that global response, and at the UN level, we welcome the continued efforts of UNOCT, CTED, and other UN agencies in supporting states to tackle it. At the same time, we must be agile in recognizing the other new and emerging threats, including the use and misuse of new technologies. We should continue efforts to counter terrorist financing and extreme right-wing terrorism, and to prevent terrorist misuse of the Internet. And finally, Mr. President, we believe it's important to bring our values to this effort. When countering terrorism, we must all ensure that we protect and promote human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. We must integrate a gender-sensitive and whole-of-society approach into these efforts. In this way, we will uphold the very principles on which the UN was founded. Mr. President, the UK will remain steadfast in the global fight against terrorism and violent extremism. We will continue to stand up for our shared values and interests. China also took part in the discussion and called for the development of a long-term solution for the problem of terrorism. The Chinese representative said that special attention to the youth in the counter-terrorism strategy. On Afghanistan, China observed that terrorism in the strife-torn nation has increased in the past two decades. China also expressed hope that Taliban would se sever ties with terrorist organizations. Russia condemned the recent developments in Afghanistan and said that it had undone 20 years of efforts in the nation since the 9-11 attacks. Stressing on the threat of terrorism in cyberspace, the Russian representative underlined that nations should ensure that the youth is protected from the nefarious activity over the Internet and recruitment by terrorist organizations. In today's hotspot section, we bring you a discussion on the developments in Afghanistan and the challenges for India. In conversation are Ashok Sajanhar, former diplomat and Nilova Roy Chaudhary, journalist. The situation that has unfolded in Afghanistan over the past five days has been quite astonishing. For us as observers, the situation has been stunning enough but for those living through these events, especially the women and children of the country, the rapid descent into the medieval ages has left them in panic and terrified about what their future holds. So I think to make a sense of what has happened over the last five days, we really have to go back to the agreement that was signed in uh, February 2020 between President Trump and the Taliban. And that is an agreement which uh, Trump wanted very desperately because uh, he thought it would help him in winning the election which was taking place after uh, another few months in November last year. And so that is why he commissioned uh, Zalmay Khalilzad as the chief negotiator with the instruction that he had to get uh, an agreement for the withdrawal of the U.S. forces with the Taliban in six months or eight months' time. So uh, Khalilzad tried that and he was able to get this agreement and uh, there were certain provisions, certain conditionalities of this agreement. The first three were that the Taliban would severe its links with all uh, terrorist organizations. The second was that it would engage in serious negotiations with the Afghan government and other representatives of the Afghan society so that the future uh, governance structure in Kabul could be discussed and decided. And third was that there would be a lessening of uh, violence. There would be no ceasefire, but there would be significant 
reduction in violence. And the fourth item, the last one was that all the foreign troops were would leave. Now, what has happened is that the first three elements of the agreement have not been met at all. And only the fourth element has been met, which uh, President Biden announced on the 13th of April that all U.S. and NATO forces would leave by the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. So we have that uh, situation when more than 95 percent of the U.S. forces have left and the Taliban has seen this as a carte blanche, that they can do whatever they want. And this is exactly what they have done. And the Afghan National Security Forces have crumbled in front of them. And we have seen that more than, uh, now I think about 30 out of the 34 provincial capitals are already under the control of the Taliban. But Ashok, the point is that Taliban was a terrorist organization. It is only one of two non-state entities, including the Al-Qaeda, that was designated by the United Nations as a terrorist organization. Now, Donald Trump and Zalmay Khalilzad basically gave the Taliban a legitimacy and uh, by negotiating directly with them in their desperation to get their boys home. But the fact remains that nothing changed as far as the Taliban actually were concerned. Taliban have reneged on every single agreement they had ever come to. And I mean, it is the ordinary people of Afghanistan who are completely in panic at this point of time. And women there are all in hiding, and it's terrifying. This attempt uh, right from 2009-2010 to separate the Taliban into a good Taliban and a bad Taliban. And India has very staunchly maintained that this is an artificial distinction in the ranks of the Taliban. The other is, it is not only the Americans who have been sort of, you know, so hypocritical and double-faced. I agree with you that the Americans uh, provided legitimacy to the Taliban by discussing with them, by negotiating with them. It is a terrorist uh, element. It is a UN-designated terrorist outfit. But you see the other countries also. Very recently, you saw that Mullah Ghani Baradar and his delegation, they visited China and they had these photo ops with the Chinese foreign minister Wang Yi. China has also been in discussions and negotiations with the Taliban for many years. So also has Russia been. You would remember that in 2018, Russia started what is known as the Moscow format. And in that, they invited few countries, Pakistan, China, United States, and the Taliban for discussions. They didn't even invite the Afghan government. So in that sense, not only was uh, the Taliban being provided legitimacy by all these governments, but they were giving it a status. They were giving it relevance and prominence that was even higher than that of the Afghan government, which Mm -hmm. whatever you might say, you know, that the elections were flawed by which Mr. Ashraf Ghani came to the power. But at least they were democratic elections to an extent. You know, this has been the uh, narrative that Pakistan has been trying to spread, that uh, the Taliban 2.0 is very different from Taliban 1.0. Now, the Taliban has learned from its mistakes that it made from uh, when it was ruling from 1996 to 2001. And now when it comes to power, then it is going to behave in a very different way. And uh, they will respect human rights. They will respect uh, women. They will allow girls to go to school. They will allow women to work. But if you see the actions of the Taliban on the ground, they sort of, you know, give a lie to all these assertions. Because very recently we have seen this fatwa by the Taliban saying that, you know, all girls above 15 and all widows below 45 they should be handed over to us and we will send them across to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and Waziristan to be Taliban fighters. Suddenly, the country appears to have gone back from the 21st century back into the 12th century or something like that, or even earlier and worse. And the entire international community is just watching a gog because even talking about Pakistan and China as having encouraged these people, the fact of the matter is that this cannot be good news for either Pakistan or China beyond a point because they follow no rules. The rules are as they please. 
So once these people get whatever power and money and whatever it is that they seek from the name of the Emirate of Afghanistan, they can very easily just move across, you know, into Pakistan on beyond the, you know, to Xinjiang and so on in China. So for whoever has been cynical, this is likely to prove quite a very difficult kind of scenario. But what happens then? Of course, the worst sufferers are the citizens of Afghanistan, are the people yeah. of Afghanistan, but yeah. they will not be the only ones to suffer. I think Pakistan also has it coming to them. And the reason why I say this is that the Taliban today is not a monolith or a homogeneous organization or body. It has mm. many factions. It has many components. In the very difficult days, and we all have to just wait and watch. Thank you very much, Ambassador Sajinhar. Thank you, Nilova. Foreign Secretary of India, Mr. Harshwardhan Shringla, on Thursday met Lord Karan Billy Moria, President of the Confederation of British Industry and member of the UK House of Lords. They discussed strengthening India-UK ties and regional issues of interest. India's Commerce and Industry Minister Piyush Goel chaired the fifth meeting of BRICS industry ministers through video conferencing on Wednesday. The industry ministers of Brazil, Russia, China and South Africa attended the meeting. India's efforts of channelizing technology towards good and smart governance, thus increasing transparency and accountability were highlighted. India has developed a vibrant and dynamic startup ecosystem, leveraging existing platforms and digital technologies, such as Aadhaar and UPI payments for ensuring delivery of critical services to the last mile. The ministers recognized the unprecedented impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, particularly in the fields of trade and industry. They agreed on the need to build human resources in line with the changing requirements accelerated by the new emerging technology to promote training and skills, development of the related workforce and business through workshops, seminars and exchange programs. They expressed their intention to collaborate with the new development bank NDB. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Guardian says hundreds of men in Pakistan investigated over mass sexual assault on women. Washington Post writes Taliban shift focus to governing, but protests, empty coffers and isolation pose challenges. Sydney Morning Herald says WHO establishes a new scientific body to examine origins of COVID-19. South China Morning Post reports Iran-China vow regional security cooperation after Taliban's Afghan takeover. Financial Times writes stocks and commodities fall on Fed and global growth jitters. Sputnik News says UNSC discusses global terror threats amid political turmoil in Afghanistan. Globe and Mail writes Hurricane Grace makes landfall near Mexico's Chulum temples. A quick look at the headlines once again. External Affairs Minister of India Dr. S. Jayashankar says the world must never compromise with the evil of terrorism in any form at the UN Security Council. UNESCO calls for the protection of Afghanistan's cultural heritage and safety of artists. Foreign nations join in rescue and relief operations in Haiti as death tolls from earthquakes soar to over 2,000. India administers over 57 crore vaccine doses under nationwide COVID vaccination program. And WHO urges nations to hold back booster doses amid slow rate of COVID-19 vaccination globally. India is celebrating the 151st birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Before we end, let us listen to his favorite bhajan Vaishnav Jan by artists from Bangladesh. And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News.